In a recent video, we outlined a two-step heuristic to determine optimal bet sizings for virtually any scenario. One aspect that we touched upon but did not discuss in detail was how to use multiple bet sizings. For gigantic poker nerds like myself, this is a controversial and complicated topic. On the one hand, there are many that believe you should only use one bet sizing in most spots up until the river. In fact, recently I had a mini debate with Doug Polk on this very topic. People in this camp take the position that using multiple sizings is for the most part too complex to execute because every bet size you add grows the game tree exponentially and so in reality it becomes impossible to assess what your range looks like on later streets accurately. This in turn makes balancing difficult because you lose track of the proportions of combos that you have in your range. Now there is a lot of merit to this argument and there are plenty of players like Doug who are far better than me that use this approach so we're not going to say that it's wrong. But we do think that this approach isn't necessarily the most relevant for every single poker player. So what do we mean by this? Well let's take Doug for example. Doug comes from the world of high stakes online heads up. He was once the top rated player in the world in this format and there are several reasons why his approach is likely optimal for this particular game. To start, in the online environment people can use HUDs to track how you're playing in every single branch of the game tree. So when you play many hands against a person, which of course is easier to do online, it's possible for your opponent to build a significant database of how you play, identify imbalances, and then punish you. This dynamic is amplified in the world of heads up where you're playing against the same opponent over and over again for tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of hands. If villain is able to identify a reliable imbalance in your game, you will likely hemorrhage EV until you identify it yourself and adjust. But this dynamic isn't as relevant for 6 max or full ring games, especially live, where even if one particular player has your number, you aren't going to have to face him very often and you can make up the EV you lose against him versus Fish or other weaker players. However in the heads up world, if your opponent identifies your weakness, there's nowhere to run. You're dead in the water. This means that balance is much more important in the online high stakes heads up world compared to other formats. And the best way to be as balanced as possible is to play a strict GTO game. That's what GTO is, a perfectly balanced and unexploitable strategy. So the closer you are to playing GTO perfectly, the less exploitable you'll be. Now of course poker is so vast that studying every possible scenario in detail is impossible. However, covering more of this ground heads up is much easier than other formats because heads up is by far the simplest game in No Limit Hold'em. In heads up, putting aside stack depth, there's only one 2-bet range, one 3-bet range, one 3-bet calling range, etc, etc. So for example, understanding your c-bet strategy using one sizing across all flops as the preflop raiser in a single raise pot is actually somewhat of a feasible endeavor. But when you add different players into the mix, the game tree grows exponentially. On the other end of the spectrum from heads up are full ring MTTs, where there are an almost infinite number of variations of 2-bet, 3-bet, and 4-bet ranges. This makes it a losing cause for most to attempt to become intimately familiar with the full game tree with any level of detail. So while it is true that reducing bet sizings does decrease the complexity of the game, in the world of MTTs for most, it would be like reducing the complexity from 99% impossible to know to 98.9% .9 impossible to know, a difference without distinction. As a result, for most players that are interested in game theory, a different approach is needed, which brings us to the other camp, which is comprised of players that utilize game trees with multiple sizings on the flop, turn, and river. Although I can't speak for everyone in this camp, as I've discussed before, the way that we approach solver use is not so much about memorizing sims or becoming experts in as many scenarios as possible through regimented drilling. Instead, our goal from the very beginning has been to create a single framework that could be used across every possible scenario including ones you've never seen before regardless of the format, whether it's MTT, cash, full ring, heads up, anti or no anti. And this approach was specifically designed with newer players in mind who likely would not gain much from attempting to learn specific spots in great detail. Our view is that beginners should not, for example, attempt to memorize their turn probe range in a 3-bet pot, low jack versus button on an ace 5-7 monotone flop, it simply would be a waste of time. Additionally, outside of the elite high stakes world, balance is just not as important. 
The truth is, balance in poker is only necessary to the extent your opponent has the ability to exploit you. So if your opponents are incapable of exploiting you, unless your imbalance is very obvious, which is usually the case at lower stakes, then spending a lot of time and energy on trying to be perfectly balanced will likely not be a very productive endeavor. But this doesn't mean that beginners can't benefit from a more general understanding of game theory whose goal, despite what many believe, isn't actually balance. The sole and solitary goal of game theory is to maximize payoffs, and balance is just one tool used to achieve this. So ascertaining how game theory maximizes payoffs has been our personal mission in these videos, to identify the universal principles that impact all GTO strategies, ranges, SPR, position, equity, EV, board dynamics, card removal, etc. So the viewer can then apply these principles to novel situations that they've never studied before. And in this video, we will offer one such principle for using multiple bet sizings by analyzing a heads-up hand played between Doug and Kevin Rabichow. Right now, Doug is in for 250,000. Yeah, you have, that's true. Kevin's in for 100,000. I've had a couple of those as well, but the, the normal like brick turn thing, I don't think we've done that yet. Top for Doug here on this flop. So Doug makes a third pot bet, which is solver approved, and this is likely the only sizing he uses in this particular spot. However, when we give the solver the option to bet geometric, we see that it does so with a decent proportion of its range. As we discussed in the bet sizing video, this is a function of Kevin's range being comprised of a variety of equity profiles. The small bet targets the weaker portion of Kevin's range, and the large bet targets the medium portion of Kevin's range. So the $10,000 question is, is there any benefit for a human being to use both sizings? We already know that there are cons to using multiple sizings, which we just discussed. And one justification that players often refer to in the single size camp is that when we remove a bet size from the game tree, it does not usually materially impact the average EV of the range. So in this case, we see that the EV of the big blinds range when allowed two sizings is $4,170. If we remove the geometric sizing and only allow the big blind to use the small bet, its EV drops to 4,156, not a huge difference. And if we remove the small sizing and only allow the big blind to use geometric, the EV is 4,157. However, while EV certainly is a very important metric, there are a couple of caveats that need to be taken into account regarding its use. The first caveat is that this number and the exploitability of this sim are not measured based on the full game of poker. They're measured based on a toy game that's limited to this specific game tree, which your opponents are not limited to. And this brings us to the first benefit of using multiple sizings, which is that it will always be closer to the true Nash equilibrium strategy. When you limit the game tree in your sim, you lose any guarantee of unexploitability. So even if you were able to implement a very simplified game tree perfectly, you could still be exploitable, and you would have no certainty that your strategy is even profitable. This is why when creating their GTO bots, the top AI researchers in the world spend significant time and resources trying to overcome the inherent limitations of game trees with reduced bet sizing options. This means that executing your own personal strategy perfectly can actually lead you in the wrong direction. For example, in the last Doug Polk hand we reviewed, when analyzing Hank's river jam, Doug mentioned that he thought 8x would likely be Hank's best bluffing combo because it would have blocked Doug's most likely set combo, pocket eights. According to Doug, it was less likely that he would have pocket queens there based on his specific strategy because he would have slow played many of those combos somewhere along the way since they would have blocked Hank's top pairs. However, according to the sim that we ran, although the small blind did slow playing queens with decent frequency, on the river, it actually had slightly more pocket queen combos than pocket eight combos, and as a result, the solver preferred to bluff queen x combos in Hank's shoes. 
Now this was a very small detail that didn't really impact Doug's decision with his aces, but it highlights the potential risk of relying religiously on a unique strategy that you've created even when you know how to play it very well. Yes, knowing your personal range will help you with balance, but the reality is that your range is simply your opponent's perception of the probability distribution of hands that you are likely to have. Your own perception of this probability distribution is largely irrelevant. So going back to this example, if your perception is that you have little to no pocket queens in this spot, but the perception of your opponent is that you do have plenty of pocket queens, that is all that really matters. This is because when thinking about card removal in the context of bluff catching, your strategy should be based not on the combos you think you have, but rather on the combos villain thinks you have, as that ultimately is what will drive the combos villain actually uses to bluff with. To put it another way, when you use very restricted game trees, it essentially puts you and your opponent on parallel universes where your perception of the player's ranges diverges from villain's perception of the player's ranges and this can result in mistakes. Given this, our preference when constructing sims has always been to create a robust game tree that although not perfect is closer to the true Nash equilibrium strategy and then generate heuristics based on that complex strategy. So what type of heuristic do we use for multiple sizings? Well, the broad strokes are actually very simple. The smaller the bet, the more merged your range should be, consisting of strong, medium strength, and weak hands. And the larger the bet, the more polar your range should be, consisting primarily of strong and weak hands. And the way you construct your range on later streets will be informed with this basic heuristic in mind. Now this might seem overly reductive to some, but the truth is, your opponent's perception of your range, which is most important, will in most cases not be more finely tuned than this. So if we filter for combos that use the small sizing in this sim at least 40% of the time, we see that this betting range contains essentially the big blind's entire equity distribution. In contrast, if we filter for combos that use the overbet at least 40% of the time, we see the strategy is much more polar. Occasionally, you will get some frequency of mid-strength hands that bet larger, oftentimes when these hands also have some other form of incremental equity like a draw, but for the most part, this betting range is all very strong and very weak hands. And this dynamic will hold true in almost any spot you look up. There may be slight variations, for example, based on which combos the solver uses to trap with, but for the most part, you will see the same pattern over and over again because it aligns with the inherent incentives of the various parts of an equity distribution. So Kevin decides to raise it up, and we do see that the solver does raise this hand some of the time with two overs and the backdoor straight draw. This raise likely is primarily focused on the air part of Doug's range, which should be relatively prevalent given his small bet. The solver generally prefers doing this without a heart, since the heart blocks more of Doug's folds like ace-jack or king-jack of hearts, but this does not make a significant difference. Now one might assume that the button's reaction to this small bet will be the same regardless of whether we use a sim with one or two sizings, but that's not the case. The overall defense strategy is very similar between the two sims, but we see that, for example, the button raises more often in the sim where two sizings were allowed. And this brings us to the second benefit, which is that studying sims with multiple sizings will better prepare you defensively against the real life bets you'll see in the wild. As noted earlier, your opponents are not restricted to using the same game tree as you, which means that if you study a game tree with only one sizing, you may be caught off guard when your opponent offensively uses a different one. So for example, in this case, instead of c-betting small, let's say that Doug overbets. In that scenario, Kevin's response should change dramatically with virtually no raising and a lot more folding. But if hypothetically Kevin only studied a sim with a smaller sizing, and he relies on precise application of outputs, he could struggle with his defense since he would have never studied this node before. Additionally, even if your opponent uses sizings that you've studied before, if their game tree allows for other sizings, that fact in and of itself could also alter the optimal defense strategy. For example, in this case, when the big blind is given the option to bet large or small, Although some of his strong hands will be allocated to the small size, 
a number of them will be allocated to the larger size, particularly those that need more protection like over pairs and top pairs. As a result, when the big blind chooses to fire the small sizing, despite having the option to also see bet large, his range will be slightly weaker compared to the sim where the big blind is only given the option to bet small, where all of his strong hands are just allocated to the small bet. And this in turn should slightly change the button's defense. Kevin going for the raise here in this three bet pot. In position with queen jack. So Doug decides to just call the raise, which we see is solver approved, though his hand is strong enough to raise as well. But what if Doug's hand was more marginal, something like ace four of clubs? Single size advocates may argue that if you don't know your range with precision in a spot like this, you won't know which borderline hand you need to defend with to avoid being exploited. Now this is undoubtedly true, and one of the most important functions of solver work is to fine tune your intuition of cutoff points between calling and folding, and value betting versus checking, etc. But for beginners, even with one sizing, the range would still be too complex to assess with any degree of accuracy. So although in theory it is easier to execute a strategy with fewer sizings, that benefit for most who don't do a lot of very specific drilling work will usually be marginal. For example, on the right, we are showing Doug's flop c-bet range, which only allows for the small bet. Realistically, how many poker players have the ability to reconstruct this range in their mind with any sort of accuracy? Very few, if any. So instead of trying to replicate this range perfectly, our approach is to rather focus on building a sense of the overall contours of the range based on the sizings used. If you used a small sizing, then most of your range should still be intact. So the big blind should still have his very strong hands like sets and over pairs, some medium hands like 7x, 5x, and other under pairs, and then some trash, including various straight draws. So if you decided to muck a hand like ace four with a backdoor flush draw, or something like ace queen off, it's not gonna be the end of the world for most players. Got plenty of equity and can pick up a lot of straight draws. Sure. That's not one of the cards though. So the turn goes check check, and we do see that Queen Jack mostly does check. As mentioned, Kevin's flop raise was likely targeting the air portion of Doug's range, but when he called, we can now exclude most of that part of his equity distribution, and Kevin does have plenty of better continuing candidates in his bluffing range, mainly in the form of straight draws. Similar to the flop, we see that if we give the button the option to bet small or geometric, the solver chooses both with decent frequency. And if we again filter for combos that use large bet at least 40% of the time, we see that the betting range is more polar, predominantly consisting of full houses, trips, and trash. Whereas if we filter for combos that use a smaller sizing at least 40% of the time, we see that the betting range is more merged, primarily featuring top pairs, which have decent but not great equity in this three bet pot. And this brings us to our third benefit of utilizing multiple sizings, flexibility. One of the most common weaknesses of beginners is that they tend to size bets based on the strength of their individual hand instead of based on the composition of their entire range. It's just very natural to utilize a bet size that fits the strength of your particular hand. But the reason why this is a weakness is because when you use sizings based on your specific hand alone, it creates the risk of making your cards face up if a substantial portion of your range does not also want to use that same sizing. The problem is that it's usually very difficult for beginners to construct ranges fluidly, so allowing for more flexibility in the game tree can be helpful for beginners since they can choose bet sizings that they feel more comfortable with. However, when you artificially limit bet sizings in the game tree, it forecloses their ability to do this. So for example, let's say that instead of Queen Jack, Rabbit Chow was holding a hand like Jack 10. This is a hand that is, in the heads up setting, strong enough to raise a flop for protection but not really strong enough to overbet on the turn. It is, however, strong enough to continue with the smaller sizing to gain more value from weaker 10x or 5x or under pairs like pocket sixes, and also to protect against Doug's floats like ace-king or ace-queen. But if Kevin's turn barrel strategy only allows for the overbet, it would remove this flexibility to fire again. As we can see, Jack-10 is generally okay betting small, 
but the overbet loses significant EV. Now, some may argue that Kevin could just use an overbet or check strategy and check Jack 10, since checking shows about the same EV as betting small. But again, we need to keep in mind that this EV reflects the theoretical value of a perfect robot playing its entire range versus another perfect robot across billions of iterations. But in reality, you aren't playing a range of hands against a robot across billions of iterations. You're playing one particular hand in this particular spot against one particular human opponent. And a beginner's real life EV of betting small might actually be significantly higher than the theoretical EV of checking in this scenario. For example, if Kevin bets small here, in most situations, Doug will check the river, which allows Kevin to then check back and fully realize. But if he checks and the turn is an overcard and Doug bets, it may put Kevin in a difficult situation where he's more likely to make an error, especially if he's a beginner. Another example would be if Kevin was holding something like Queen-9, a junkie draw. A number of these types of combos favor the smaller sizing over checking or betting large, which is mainly reserved for better draws like 8-9 or 8-6. And on the flip side, if Kevin only used a small bet or check strategy on this middle pairing turn, it would foreclose him from setting up an efficient river shove with a hand like pocket fives or a seven that would love to play for stacks against Doug's 10x combos. Another benefit of using a flexible game tree is that it gives you more options to exploit with. For example, if Doug is the type that is stubborn on the flop, but gives up easily to another barrel on the turn, then Kevin would likely want to use a smaller sizing here. And if Doug was just a pure calling station, Kevin would likely want to lean towards larger sizings. But if you rigidly adhere to a single sizing model, you won't be able to accrue additional EV in this way. Crab's gonna get a free chance at a queen or a jack. No go. So Doug makes nearly a full pot size bet and eerily in the sim, which allowed only one sizing on the flop, Doug's specific combo is the only one that bets this sizing most of the time. Most of the other ace 10 combos prefer to block bet, though betting full pot in both sims has essentially equivalent EV as there are plenty of weaker hands, mostly weaker 10X combos in Kevin's range that can call this bet after raising the flop and checking back the turn. Note that even on the river, the overall equity distribution in both sims remains roughly the same. Since Doug used a small bet on the flop, his range has some very strong hands like full houses and trips, some moderately strong hands like over pairs and top pairs, medium hands like 5x and other under pairs, and then some trash, mostly missed draws. The proportions are slightly different, but the types of combos in range are basically the same. And so let's ask the same question that we did on the flop. Would most players be able to execute this river strategy with precision? If the answer is yes, then the single size argument becomes stronger because instead of having to know multiple river ranges depending on the flop c-bet size used, you could just familiarize yourself with this one river range for this particular line and execute it perfectly. But if the answer is no, then the benefits of simplifying the game tree become more tenuous. Now, obviously I can't speak for every poker player, but I would venture to guess that the vast majority will never reach the point where they're able to accurately replicate a complex river range like this. And remember, this is a single line based on a single flop turn in river. Imagine trying to then repeat this process across all the different branches of the game tree for all possible turn and river combinations. The truth of the matter is that most of us peasants simply don't have the capacity to calculate extremely complex thousand big blind river spots down to 5% accuracy, so any benefits in terms of simplification when reducing bet sizings are likely marginal at best and arguably are outweighed by the benefits of using a generalized heuristics based approach that allows for multiple sizings. Kevin, in the blender here. Is he thinking about a call with this hand? I can't see him. He's done. Makes the, good. makes the call. Wow. So Kevin makes the bold call with queen high. However, the solver pure folds this hand and it loses significant EV when calling. 
And assuming this wasn't an exploitative play, I think it's a good example of how even for someone regarded as one of the best heads up players on the planet, it's very difficult to know your range with exact precision. This game is just too complex, especially when it comes down to river scenarios. Yes, if you use fewer sizings in your game tree, it will make your sim less complex, which should in theory give you a better sense of the proportions of different combos that you have in your range. And this is particularly important in bluff catching and bluffing scenarios to ensure that you aren't going overboard in one direction or the other. However, even with one flop and turn sizing, this game is still immeasurably complex, especially if you use mixed strategies. And so from our vantage point, for most players, particularly newer ones, attempting to memorize ranges with precision will be a futile effort. Instead, a generalized heuristics based approach that allows for flexibility will be more accessible. So how as a practical matter would such a heuristics based approach work in this sort of bluff catching scenario? Well, in the GTO check system, we always start with the macro analysis, which primarily focuses on the overall range matchups. Given Doug's relatively large bet, it's probably safe to assume that his range is polar, which means that the value portion of his range is likely no weaker than a strong top pair, and the bottom part of his range is likely to be unmade hands, probably most lower than ace high, which heads up, likely has at least a modicum of showdown value against Kevin's flop raise give ups. The next step is then the meso analysis, where we allocate our hand to a class based on its strength relative to villain's equity distribution. This will tell us the primary incentives of our hand, because hand classes tend to accrue EV in the same way, regardless of the scenario. So in this case, queen high is obviously not very strong. Generally speaking, your bluff catchers should be losing to all of villain's value and beating all of his bluffs. And in this case, at least in this sim, Kevin's hand loses to king queen and king jack. So queen high is likely just in the non-realizing slash air class that should just pure full to any river bet. That being said, I think queen high is closer to the borderline than one might think at first glance. One thing that we need to keep in mind is that the relative strength of your hand will be heavily dependent on the width of villain's range. The wider the range, generally speaking, the stronger hero's hand tends to become because it will be ahead of a greater proportion of combos in villain's range. So in this case, perhaps Kevin thinks Doug wouldn't float hands like King Queen or King Jack facing the raise on the flop, or maybe he thinks Doug checks these hands on the river, in which case Queen Jack would probably be a bluff catching candidate since it is ahead of a number of busted draws in Doug's range such as 8-9, 9-6, and 8-4, which I'm guessing is what Kevin was focused on. But even if we were to assume that Queen Jack is a bluff catcher, it is unlikely to be the best candidate in his range when we consider the last stage of the GTO check system, the microanalysis. In this level, we differentiate hands of the same class based on their unique characteristics. The general idea is that usually you'll have too many bluff catching candidates to call all of them absent exploitative reads, so you will use card removal to decide which ones to call and which ones to fold. Now in perfect theory world, this process would entail determining the exact percentage of this class that you want to call based on the size of the bet in relation to the pot, and then you would allocate combos to the calling bucket in order of the hands with the best card removal properties until that calling percentage is filled up. But for most of us common folks, this process is not feasible to do in the moment. Your average player is not going to be able to recall all of the combos he has in his range or the proportions of these combos that are present. So how do you determine when to bluff catch in our heuristics based approach? Two words, combo selection. That is, you retroactively assess specific combos that you're likely to have given the line that have the best bluff catching characteristics. And the more combos with better blockers that you can think of, the more inclined you should be to fold. To draw an analogy, in the strict GTO approach, you essentially take the role of a mathematician where you determine whether to call based on a precise formula that takes into account the bet and the proportion of all the combos in your range. However, the conceptual GTO approach is more akin to being an archaeologist, where you recreate select combos from your range based on the action up until that point. So what would that look like in practice? Well, in this case, it would mean thinking about the hands that you could have called the 3-bet with preflop, raise a flop, and then check back the turn. 
So maybe something like Jack-10 or 10-9 or 10-8. These hands are unlikely to beat any of Doug's value given the sizing, so they are bluff catchers. And they do block Doug's stronger 10x combos. Or maybe something like Ace-5 or King-5. Given that Doug bets small on the flop, it would be reasonable for Kevin to raise some 5x combos for protection, and Ace and King would block some of Doug's overpairs, 7x and 10x combos. Given this, both 10x and 5x are likely better bluff catchers than Queen Jack, which blocks Jack 8 and Jack 9, hands that Doug certainly could have called the flop raise with and then bluffed the river. Now obviously, this method is not going to result in calling at the precisely correct GTO frequency, but for most folks, that is not remotely achievable. And as we said at the top, you only need balance to the extent your opponents can exploit you, and most opponents aren't able to exploit relatively minor frequency imbalances. So instead, our view is that overall frequency imbalances may be better addressed through self-database analysis and then skewing your in-game thought process in the opposite direction of that imbalance to bias your frequencies. For example, if you tend to be a calling station, when bluff catching, if you can just identify a handful of better bluff catchers, that could be enough to make you fold. Now just to be clear, this video isn't an admonition against doing solver work. The reality is, even if you use a conceptual GTO approach, the more solver work you put in, the better you'll be able to calibrate your strategies closer to the equilibrium, which is important because it's very hard to assess probabilities in real time. But as we've shown, utilizing sims with multiple sizings does have some benefits, and it can be abstractly applied using heuristics, even by beginners, who are outside the 1% of poker players that rely on memorizing sims.